Mama was right. You are what you eat. If you eat your vegetables, your beets and your carrots, then you'll grow up big and strong. If you eat spinach by the can, then you'll grow up with ridiculously massive forms like Popeye the Sailor Man. If you eat junk food and sweets and toxic things, then it has an effect on your body. If you eat too much of something, it affects your health. If you eat too little of something, it opens the door to issues of malnutrition. Mama was right. You really are what you eat. What you eat goes down inside of you, changes you at a molecular level, gives you the strength that you need to live and to love and to dance and to breathe. You are what you eat. Anybody ever hear that growing up? This morning, John, our prophet, our seer, re receives a request from God to add a peculiar new meal into his diet plan. Eat this bittersweet word. What is this bittersweet word? How do we eat it? How does it change the way we live? How does it transform us? What is the task of the church? This morning we're going to discover that once you eat this bittersweet word, you can never be the same. You can only breathe fire. Grab your Bibles. We're going to need it this morning. Let's pray over the Word of God. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. It is a light unto our path. It is a mirror that shows us who we are. It's a revelation, O oh God, that shows us who you are. So we pray that this would not be simply time of another church service, but we come humbly seeking an encounter with you. We ask that you would cause these words to burst forth from their ink cage and live and dance in us in an incarnate way. And we ask the Holy Spirit that you would give us the strength to not simply be hearers of the word only, but doers also. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. The word the Lord has sent to us today is a bitter word. It's a word that brings us face to face with the judgment of God. It's the kind of word that makes some people decide that the church is not for them. Or that they're not called to follow Jesus. As we burst the bitter seals of this book called Revelation, it might make your stomach turn. It might make you sick. The word the Lord has sent to us today is a sweet word. It's a sweet word, this gospel of Jesus Christ, this angelion, this life-giving word that goes down inside of us, changes us from the inside out. This word that tells us about the grace of God that frees us from the shackles, the chains of our addictions and our shame and our guilt. It's a good word. Somebody give me an amen. amen. It's a sweet word like honey on a hungry tongue. The word the Lord has sent to us today is a bitter, sweet word. Maybe it'll cause some of both of those effects. This morning we leave the scenes of uh, utter chaos and demonic forces being set loose on the earth. There's Walter Edwards so elegantly said last week, all hell breaking loose. We now leave that scene and we behold this striking angel, epic in proportions. This angel stands clothed with clouds, symbolic of the very presence of God. This angel stands wearing a rainbow crown, symbolic of the grace of God and the promises of God to never flood the earth again. Even though all hell is breaking loose on the earth and the clock is ticking, it's the last second before midnight, here comes this angel, this, this messenger of grace wearing a rainbow as a crown. This angel stands with feet firmly planted, one on the land and one on the sea, symbolic of the fact that the message that this angel proclaims is one for the entire earth, the entire cosmos. And the legs of this angel are fiery pillars reaching back to the captivity of the Israelites in Egypt who were guided by night from their slavery by a pillar of fire and by smoke during the day. Those pillars are in fact the legs of this massive angel. And this huge angel stands with one little book in his hand. One Biblos. 
And John hears a voice from heaven, the seven thunders rumble, and there are things that are sealed up that John is told not to say. The truth is we don't know everything, ladies and gentlemen. Can I get an amen? Amen. But what we are given to know is the contents of this little book. And John is told to come forward and to take it and to eat it. Katasteo is the Greek word there. Consume it. Eat it down all the way, this book. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't make a habit of regularly eating books. Does anybody? I said that in New Life this morning, and uh, some of the kids said, ew, yuck, right? I don't know about you, but have you tried to take a bite out of your Bible lately? It's not a pleasant experience. So what does this mean? What is this command to eat this bittersweet word? Well, now, we know that John is a man fully submerged in scriptures. He is immersed in the Old and the New Testament. This is a man who lives the scriptures, breathes the scriptures, dreams the scriptures. And so every vision that we get as part of Revelation is photoshopped, if you will, with other pieces of scripture. So where do we see this eating of a book? Well, Jeremiah the prophet is told to eat the book. Ezekiel is told to eat this sweet book and go proclaim this bitter message. So what we have here is a prophetic call story. When God calls prophets, he tells them to eat his word. You see, the truth is you can't go and proclaim something, you can't live something out until once you've digested it and consumed it and made it part of who you are. Y'all got to wake up this morning. I can't even preach. Can I get it? Amen. Everybody awake this morning. You can't proclaim a message until you make it part of who you are, part of your DNA. Eat the book. Consume it. Uh, bring it down inside of you and it'll give you the energy to transform you from the inside out. But this word will make your stomach bitter, but be as sweet as honey on your tongue. Now, the people called Methodists, we like to eat. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. And we all know that we maybe spend a little too much time at the uh, all-you-can-eat Chinese buffet once in a while, or those potlucks where all those unhealthy dishes are going around, or maybe you spend a little too much time at the Golden Corral at the ice cream machine. Uh, maybe you're heading home from one of those experiences and realizing uh, your stomach starts rumbling. There's that bitterness, that sour belly that you can't wait to get home and get to that porcelain stool at the house, right? So you can get out those contents however you can by whatever means. Somebody give me an amen. amen. John's told if you eat this word, it'll make your belly bitter. It'll make you sick to your stomach, this word you've been sent to proclaim. But it'll be sweet as honey on the tongue. You know, I love honey. As I was going through my uh, pancreatitis issues and looking for natural remedies, I found out that raw honey, God really knows what he's doing when he creates stuff, can I get amen? That raw honey has these healing effects on the body. It heals the pancreas and different parts and different organs. So I made that raw honey a part of my regular diet. I eat it first thing in the morning when I get up. And the thing about raw honey, it's always sweet. You never habituate to the sweetness of raw honey. You can eat it every day for the rest of your life. It's still going to be sweet. That honey has healing effects on the body. This word that John is given to consume is a word that goes down inside. It heals. It transforms. It never gets not sweet. You can never habituate to the sweetness of the gospel, the goodness of God's word that is life-giving and truth-telling, that turns our worlds upside down. It, makes us passionate with the fires of God, this word that we consume that comes inside of us and changes our lives. Somebody can get amen. You know, on this past vacation, I had the opportunity, I tried when I'm on vacation to line up as many worship experiences as possible. So I'll go to four or five worship experiences if I can get it on the calendar to fit it in and try different things and experience different fellowships. And Jill and I and our family, we had the opportunity to go to this mega church. Uh, in Ormond Beach. And we went there and it, literally huge, beautiful facilities. Everything is pristine. We went into the children's area. Their, their children's church area is bigger than our whole facility here at Wildwood UMC. And we went in and there's people of every race and space and culture. They got a bus ministry that brings in the poor folks. There's affluent people there. There's people of every color. Uh, and there's a worship army up on the stage. Literally over 100 people up there leading and singing and people doing artwork and all this stuff going on in worship. And I look over, 
My wife is raising her hands and there's tears running down her face. My little children are raising their hands. They're worshiping and crying. The spirit, the anointing of God was so heavy in the place you couldn't do anything but worship. Amen. Then the preacher gets up and preaches three points why dads are better than superheroes. No lie, no exaggeration. That's what he preached. And so later that day, Michael Jr., uh, comes to me and says, Daddy, I'm so full of the Holy Spirit, I can't stand it. He's never said anything like that before. But little Alex, even on the way to the parking lot, he's 10 years old, he says, Dad, that was awesome, that was powerful, but there was something wrong with that sermon. <laughs> That's my little Methodist preacher boy. <laughs> and and I, I, I thought to myself, wow, even at 10 years old, he's sensitive to understand that that was not the bittersweet gospel of Jesus Christ. There was no call to transformation. There was no confrontation of sin. There was no call to a better life. It was honey. It tasted good. It was sweet. You went home feeling good about yourself. Ear candy, if you will. But where was the gospel? Where was the confrontation with the sin and the wickedness of people's lives and the call to a new kind of life in Jesus Christ? Amen. This message that is given to John is a bittersweet gospel, a word. And it's not given to John just so he can sit on it or get a golden star and say, I got this word. It's purposeful. The word is given to John so that he can then in the 11th verse, go forth and prophesy. Prophetuo is the Greek word there. We're going to come back to that word in the 11th chapter because it ties the two together. But he's sent to prophesy, not just to keep the word in your belly, but go forth and speak it to peoples and nations and languages and kings. And of course, God and His omniscience and His all-powerful and His all-knowing knows that in fact this word, this revelation, the contents of this book, which is an amalgamation of all the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, brought into one masterpiece, this, this word through John the Seer, this word has been proclaimed to every nation, to every race, to every space, in every language in all the earth. God was right. Can I get an amen? Amen. Then we get to the 11th chapter, and I'll give you a little warning here right up front. The book of Revelation is the most difficult book in the Bible to interpret. Can I get an amen? amen. Nicole, can I get an amen? Amen. Uh, and the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation is the most difficult chapter in the entire book to interpret. So we now move from this scene of this angel standing there, and suddenly we see this temple. God gives John this measuring stick to measure the temple. And understand that John's prophecy here is not a linear, logical timeline where we're going from point A to point B. It's not a game plan 2,000 years before the end of the world. And here's the step-by-step -step process of how things are going to happen. That's not what's happening in John's revelation. We're forwards in time. We're backwards in time. We're in the throne room. We're down at the pit. We're on the earth where all hell is breaking loose. We're all over the place. It's not a linear uh, thing. Really, to think about Revelation as a series of postcards with images and words that have to be understood on their own accord is, in fact, a helpful way to interpret this. So we get to this 11th chapter. There's this imagery of the temple. Well, we know that in early Christianity, the temple did not mean the, the building in Jerusalem that was leveled in 70 A.D., they began to use the temple language to talk about what? The church of Jesus Christ, the people, right? Paul says, don't you know you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? That you are, Peter says, like living stones being built along on top of this cornerstone that is Jesus Christ. The, the church is not a, a building or a steeple. The church is a people. Somebody give me an amen. amen. You are the temple. That temple that was leveled in 70 AD and has never been raised again. You are that new temple. The priesthood of believers sent into the world. So there's this imagery of measuring the temple at a time when this temple is going to be trampled. Now, Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. You don't need a temple anymore. You don't need a priest anymore. The veil is torn when Jesus cries out from the cross, symbolic of the fact that now all people now have access to God. Can somebody give me an amen this morning? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that temple is going to be trampled for a time, John lets us know. And then I will grant my two witnesses. Now, here are these two witnesses. A lot of speculation out there. Is this Moses and Elijah? Are these two literal people that are going to come at the end of time? Um, is this all symbolic? Is there some literal to this? Well, obviously, these two witnesses do represent Moses and Elijah, the prophet and the law, and all those things. 
Uh, but they're going to be sent to do a specific task. And that specific ta task is to prophesy. Uh, just like John has now been given this bittersweet word to eat and told to go prophesy. Now these two witness, witnesses come and their function is to prophesy, to speak the word of God. Now that word prophecy, it's a little scary, isn't it? Uh, whenever somebody tells me they have the gift of prophecy, I, I kind of shrug a little bit because we usually correlate it with making predictions for the future. But that's actually not what the word actually means. It can be used in that way. But to prophesy is simply to speak under divine inspiration. It's to launch out in a discourse that's empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's to speak the living words of God under His inspiration. Are y'all with me so far? Amen. amen. So the, these two witnesses are sent to do that. Now in the fourth verse, we get some clarity here of who the two witnesses are. These are the two olive trees. And these are the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now we've seen this imagery of lampstands and olive oil. Uh, it takes olive oil to fuel the lamp, to burn, right? Uh, olive trees were symbolic of the nation of Israel and of the kingly line. The lampstand uh, was symbolic of the priestly caste and the priest of Israel. And so uh, we've seen this imagery of a lampstand before in this book, though, haven't we? Who are the lampstands in the book of Revelation? The churches. Remember our Jesus who comes inspecting the tires, kicking the tires of those seven congregations in Asia Minor and examining the filaments and seeing if they are shining with the light of Christ into the world or not. The two lampstands are the church of Jesus Christ. The witness, the two witnesses, the temple, it's us, ladies and gentlemen. And we got a job to do, to prophesy the word of God. And so these two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth could potentially be, of those seven churches, five of them are called out uh, and told to repent. Two of those churches, Little Smyrna and Philadelphia, are commended for being faithful unto death and shining the light of Christ into the world. Perhaps that is the two witnesses that John's referring to. But in a greater sense, it's the church, ladies and gentlemen. And the church is now embattled by this beast that comes up from the abyss. We're going to learn more about this beast as we go through the book. And it levels them. It destroys them. Okay, they are sent for a while to do what? To prophesy. And fire pours forth from their mouth that consumes their foes. They have eaten the bittersweet gospel of Jesus Christ and they are breathing fire out into the world. They are speaking God's truth into a world of lies. And whenever you do that, you can expect some opposition. Amen? Yes. Whenever you start to realize your call and to step out prophetically and do what God's called you to do, you can expect some opposition. And so these two witnesses are slain in the street. The worst disgrace that can happen is a body be left to decompose. And so these witnesses uh, <coughs> are left there to die for a time. Their bodies left in the street and they are mocked. Perhaps this is a, a metaphoric ideal that the church is going to be dead for a time. That the world is going to seem to have victory over the church. Maybe in the United States of America, maybe today that's the situation. Where the prophetic message of the church has become irrelevant. It's been silenced. It has no meaning, no power. Because these prophetic uh, talking about fire coming down from the sky and the Nile being turned into blood. These are powers of the prophets. And they are powers that now exist in the mouth of the church. When we speak the word of Christ into the world, it brings the plans of the enemy to ruin. But once they have been slain and silenced, and it's not looking very good, then suddenly there's this word of hope. That God breathes and these two prophets are resurrected from the dead. And they stand again and they boldly proclaim. See, the hope of Christian people is not that we get sucked out and taken to some other dimension or that we're going to sit on clouds one day and play harps. The hope of the church of Jesus Christ is the resurrection from the dead. That Jesus Christ, who is the first fruits of the dead, who was slain for my sin and for yours, that that Jesus, just as he was resurrected, changed at a molecular level, but stands triumphant as the death-conquering master of all, that we are going to be resurrected in the same way that Jesus was. That we too are going to have new life breathed into us. And that Jesus is going to come and to reign and to rule in this earth. The seventh trumpet blows. The time is up. The clock is ticked. And now comes God's judgment on the earth. The seventh angel blows his trumpet. There's loud voices in heaven. And it says the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our God and his Messiah. 
the vision of Revelation is not some rapture experience. It's not being taken to some other dimension. The vision of Revelation is that Jesus Christ comes back just like he says he would. He reigns and he rules on this earth and this place in the center of his people for all of time. He resurrects the dead and he comes to rule and reign and snatch back the power from the kingdoms and the false empires of this world. He comes and he reigns forever and ever in the 24 elders, who I believe are Methodists. Can I get an amen? Because they like to sing. And they are singing and praising God. And the people called Methodists sing our faith. Can I get an amen? And they fall down on their face. What can you do when Jesus Christ comes into the building? But fall down on your face and worship. And so they fall and they worship and they sing. We give thanks to you, Lord, oh God Almighty. Y'all should be getting excited about this. Then they start to praise God because they know that he's the death conquering master of all. They know that they've been saved. They know that their sins have been washed away. And now they will dwell in his presence for all eternity. I thought somebody shouted and say amen. Get excited about this. You have taken your great power from the empires of the world. You have conquered the beast and turned empires upside down. The nations raged against you and the world made war against you. But you have come to judge the living and the dead. This does not just mean something for the people that will be alive when Jesus Christ returns. When he returns, the dead will be raised. And every person who's ever lived, every human being that ever was and ever will be, will stand before this judge and we will give an account for our lives and whether or not we receive the grace of God that is found in Jesus Christ. Somebody give me an amen. amen. And he will, he will reward his servants, the prophets. There is a reward in heaven, ladies and gentlemen. Now, we're not talking about salvation. Salvation is given by grace. There's no reward. It's just given. It doesn't make any sense. But when we stand before this king and this judge, there will be rewards that will be given. I don't know about you, but I want to hear God say, well done, yes. good and faithful servant. I just want God to tell me, hey, if you're in, you can go scrub toilets for all eternity. I would be happy with that. Can I get an amen? As long as I can be a janitor, whatever you need of me, Lord, I'll do it. But there's going to be crowns that are given. There's going to be glory that will be given for the, the least and the smallest of the saints. But it's not going to be a good day. It's going to be a bitter day for those destroyers who have destroyed the earth. You want to know who's in trouble when Jesus Christ returns? It's those who rob and steal and kill. It's those who get in bed with empire. It's those who worship the beast and mammon and the gods of this world instead of his slain lamb still standing. And then God's temple in heaven was opened and we see this vision of the Ark of the Covenant, which we've been looking for for a couple thousand years since the Babylonian captivity. And it was with God the whole time. And it comes down to earth and God makes his dwelling with his people and he's with them for all eternity. See, this is a bittersweet word, this gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a sweet word that gives life, that transforms us from the inside out. It's a sweet word that gives us hope and a passion in the future, even in the midst of a world that is broken and marred with sin and death. It's a sweet word for those of us that are shackled in chains of sin and guilt who can now have freedom and the newness of life, but it's a bitter word for those who realize the call to follow Jesus is a call to the cross. It's a bitter word for those who realize that my life is not my own anymore. It belongs to God. It's a bitter word for those who see the people of the world amassing wealth and power and uh, engaging in the desires of the flesh when we're called to give all our money away. We're called to serve the least and the lost. And it's a bitter word when as serving the least and the lost, they put a knife in our back or bite our hand or betray us or don't make it. It's a bitter word that when we are following Jesus Christ and giving our lives, giving ourselves away in a world that's all about me. It's a bitter word when we realize that God's judgment will come. And then only He can sort these things out. And it's a bitter word when we realize that God doesn't throw anybody into the lake of fire. We throw ourselves into the lake of fire by rejecting His grace even at the final hour. You know, we got a pretty sweet deal. If you were born in Rome, man, it was a sweet setup. You lived under the Pax Romana, even though that peace, that Roman peace, was kept at the edge of the sword. You had uh, access to education and the wealth. You didn't have to worry about how you were going to eat. Everything was taken care of in Rome. You could uh, join the imperial cult and you could make connections. You could pull yourselves up by your own bootstraps and be wealthy and affluent. 
It was a bitter deal for those born outside of that empire. Those who were exploited, those who were enslaved, those who watched their homes pillaged of goods and a steady trail of resources leaving from them to feed the beast that is Rome. You know, it's a sweet deal if you're born in the United States of America, especially if your skin is white. It's a sweet deal that we have access to education and affluence and wealth and that we can get in clubs and we can have wealth and property and all these things. It's a good deal to be born in the United States of America where we don't have to worry about anything but going to Walmart and getting our price match promise. But it's a bitter deal for the slaves whose scarred backs built this country. It's a bitter deal for those third, third world nations that are exploited and suck dry of the resources to feed the beast. It's a bitter word for those that are discriminated and permanently held down because of their race or their ethnicity. And it's a bitter word in the midst of an empire for those that seek to live for Jesus Christ when we are scoffed and humiliated. But ladies and gentlemen, Jesus has sent us to consume this bittersweet word and breathe the fire of this truth out into the world. The fire of this truth was is the source is the word of God. The nation doesn't set for us what our truth is. The peoples of this world don't set for us what our truth is. It's the bittersweet gospel of Jesus Christ that defines our truth. I don't called to consume that bittersweet word. How are you doing that? Do you have a yearly Bible reading plan? Are you staying in the word? Are you reading it was for you? Will you come to Christ? Will you come to his bittersweet table? The Lord be with you. Room that great Methodist publication, you never know who they'll let write in that thing. Yeah. <laughs> are you studying together communally the scriptures with others? Are you showing up at Wednesday night Bible study? Are you reading and marking and inwardly digesting the word like John Wesley said we should? Are you consuming it? Do you need it in your life just like you need air and oxygen and food? Is it sweet every time you taste it? How are you consuming that bittersweet word of God? And at the end of the day, we don't consume it so that we can get a gold star or a sticker. Right. We consume it because we are called to go forth and proclaim it. Yes. Right. We have to speak with prophetic fire the truth of God's word into a world of lies. Yes. And that doesn't mean we've got to sit up on a soapbox somewhere and beat people over the head with the Bible. We've got to speak God's word into people's lives. And that can be as simple as, you want to really light somebody's life up with the fire of God? Tell them how much God loves them. Amen. Tell them that Jesus Christ died for them. Tell them that, that they're special and uniquely made and that God has a passion and a purpose for their life. Sometimes we've got to share a bitter word that this is not God's best for you. That, that God gave His life so that you don't have to engage in those behaviors anymore. But we've got to go forth into the world and speak the truth with prophetic fire. We've got to consume that word on a daily basis. You know, Mama was right. You really are what you eat. And this morning we've been invited to this table to consume the grace of God. This is a bittersweet table. It's bitter that we are confronted face to face with the reality of our sin and the fact that Jesus Christ died for my sin and for yours. It's a bitter table where we realize that Jesus drank the wrath of the cup of the world on our behalf. It's a bitter table where we realize that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and we are helpless. But it's also a sweet table. It's the sweet table where we come again and again to taste of the goodness and the grace of God. It's this sweet table where we come to again consume that meal of grace for nobody in the house this morning was perfect this week. I don't know I wasn't for you. But it's this table where we come to taste again that it's not only the Christ who died, but the Christ who rose and the Christ who will come again. It's at this bittersweet table where we are confronted with the reality of our sin. But we
we receive the grace of an all-loving God who sends angels with rainbow crowns to tell us it's not too late, that this table is for you. Will you come to Christ? Will you come to his bittersweet table? The Lord be with you.